When you're scrolling on social media or browsing in a stationery store, uh, or even looking through advertisements in a magazine, do you ever see expressions like girl boss or lady boss or hashtags like rise and grind? Maybe not, maybe you have no idea what I'm referring to and you're thinking, what is she talking about? But when I go through my social media feeds, um, I notice that I see a lot of these terms used. Uh, and sometimes I feel like they're empowering and exciting. Other times they make me a little bit uncomfortable or even queasy. This article gets to some of these ideas and then makes a much bigger argument, not just about terms uh, like lady boss, um, but about what is encouraged uh, in the workplace and really beyond. Based on your um, comments from the discussion, from the homework, it sounds like this article is interesting to a lot of you, so I was really excited uh, to read those posts. Notice from the title uh, that there's an allusion with an A. Remember, an allusion is an unacknowledged reference that the writer assumes that the reader will pick up on. Uh, there's an allusion to a book called Leaning In. Uh, a lot of people didn't realize, a lot of people in this class didn't notice that allusion, probably because the book is a few years old now, it's a little bit dated. But Leaning In was a book written by uh, Sheryl Sandberg, who was the COO of Facebook. Uh, I don't think she's currently the COO. And the book was very famous and caused quite a stir uh, when it came out. And this idea of leaning in means to engage with the workforce, right? To make things happen for yourself, uh, to lean in um, to uh, being a working woman. I want to talk about this article just very informally. If we were in a, a typ typical semester, I think we have a great in-class discussion about it. It's a pretty straightforward article, right? It's probably one of the easiest articles to read just on the surface. It's only a page and a half. It's not incredibly complex um, and it's funny. What I think is so interesting about the article is she shifts between a very informal, sometimes hyperbolic, um, funny language, uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, in the midst of some sort of silly pun or reference to some sort of hashtag or silly expression like mansplaining, uh, she says something really incisive and really powerful. That's one thing I like about the article, even though I might not agree with all the sentiments expressed. Now, remember, we want to read articles with the grain and also against the green. And of course, since this was an op-ed, um, you're not going to find a lot of research um, because it's an op-ed and not an academic essay like some of the other essays we've read this semester. As you read, think about what cultural literacy is required to understand the allusions, not just in the title, but throughout this, there aren't allusions to Shakespearean plays or uh, Greek epics, but there are allusions to all this language that we use now, or some of us use now on social media. Like I said before, words like lady boss or mansplaining. Um, how and why does the writer shift tones? Like I said, I think her tone shift is very um, effective, um, but you might not have had that same opinion. Let's talk about the first couple of paragraphs. When I read them, I get the sense that she's arguing that this type of feminism, not fe feminism itself, although that word to some people means very different things, um, but this specific type of a restyling of feminism that isn't exactly feminism, uh, I get the sense that she's saying that it's been somehow um, commodified. How do I, or what, what gives me that sense? What words could I use to prove my theory? Well, she uses words like sold back to us as feminism, right? Which makes us think of a monetary value or a promise. Uh, also words like um, fist pumping, fist pumping restyling of feminism. So all of these words suggest something not very cerebral and thoughtful, but instead some sort of marketing ploy. Uh, it almost makes it sound like this weird perversion of, according to her, this perversion of feminism that isn't real feminism um, is like a cult. Uh, like we are fist pumping as if we're cheering on our team without really giving it a whole lot of thought. Um, I don't think she's critiquing feminism as a whole. Uh, I think she's talking about something that in her view isn't actually a uh, feminist at all. I love this hyperbole in the beginning. She says, um, if we were like Puritans and we, we gave value names to our children, like Charity or Constance or Patience, 
Now, all of the girls born in America, of course, or half of them, obviously that's being really hyperbolic, would be named empowerment or assertiveness. I asked you to come up with um, examples of what you think the male version of this would be, and people had some pretty funny responses. What do you think about that? Do you think if we were naming kids, especially girls, um, to represent uh, an ideal or what we want um, their personalities to be like, that we would use words like empowerment um, or leadership or something like that? What do you think? I also noticed that she begins with a they say. So she references what other people are arguing. Now she's not very specific about it. She defines it as a cultural moment or a, a, a restyled version of feminism. She could be much more precise about exactly what it is that she's talking about, but she gives us some examples. And some of them are supposed to be ridiculous, I think, to be funny, uh, but also she's making a more serious point. So the idea is that if women can learn to state our needs more forcefully, um, we can st and stop apologizing and do some power poses in the bathroom uh, and act like lady bosses, then the glass ceiling will all but disappear. And of course, she is oversimplifying that argument, right? I don't think there are very many serious people who are saying, hey, all women need to do is um, ask for raises a little bit more aggressively and be a little bit more like men and then the glass ceiling will go away. I don't, I, obviously that's not the case. Uh, and I think she is aware that she's oversimplifying the argument here. She's being a little bit tongue in cheek. I love this line. Women, be more like men. Men, as you were. So what I like about this is it's funny right? It captures our attention. Uh, but also if we look at the structure or the syntax, uh, it almost uses chiasmus. So chiasmus means when there's some sort of parallel structure, but it's reversed. Uh, so women be more like men, men be more like women would be what we would expect, right? In that traditional inversion or chiasmus. But instead women be more like men, men as you were. So keep going as you were before. Don't change at all. You're fine. It's women who need to do the changing. So again, she uses humor here, uh, but she's also using a stylistic technique uh, to make us think, well, wait a minute, it should be men be more like women, which is her argument, although it's a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, she's not telling men to become women literally uh, or even uh, emotionally, but to take some of the qualities associated with women into the workforce. Uh, I think that line is really powerful. She also references a term that we've talked about this semester, which is straw man. There's a whole lecture on logical fallacies, and one of them that we discussed was the straw man. That is when you attempt to oversimplify or distort or weaken your opposition's argument, and then you dismantle it to make yourself look better. But just like filling up a scarecrow with a bunch of straw and then pushing them over doesn't make you look very strong, right? After all, it's just filled with fluff and straw. Uh, taking someone's argument and watering it down or twisting it and then deconstructing it doesn't make you look very strong either. Uh, that is a straw man argument. But here, of course, she uses straw woman uh, because she's talking about how corporations are saying, really, it's women who need to become more assertive. And the onus is then on women, not on the corporations themselves to change uh, the system. This is a good place to point out uh, the Toolman model that we studied earlier in the semester. Remember, the Toolman model has a claim, it has grounds, and then between the claim and the grounds, we have some sort of warrant or or assumption that's sometimes um, kind of implicit or obvious um, and oftentimes should be made more explicit or unpacked a little bit and then supported itself. So here uh, it's not her own argument. She is unpacking and explaining some of the assumptions behind the other argument that women need to be more assertive and that that would uh, shatter the glass ceiling once and for all. So the assumption that assertiveness is more a more valuable trait than, say, deference is itself the product of a ubiquitous and corrosive gender hierarchy. So ubiquitous means everywhere all at once. So what do you think about that? Is assertiveness, right, asserting your needs, stating uh, what you want, uh, being clear and direct and even kind of forceful, is that something we value or should value more than deference, which can mean to uh, yield to somebody else or to give more respect to somebody else who might have more experience? Um, are we right to assume that, yeah, of course you'd want to be assertive uh, more than deferential? I would think you would need both. I think both are really good qualities, and I don't think either quality um, 
has one gender that owns it, right? Certainly not all men are assertive and not all women are deferential, obviously. Um, as a rule, anything associated with girls or women from the color pink to domestic labor is by definition assigned a lower cultural value than things associated with men or boys. Um, this also reminds me of Toulmin. Remember with the Toulmin model, we're supposed to put some sort of limits on um, our argument. So you'd say in certain situations or in XYZ case or generally or sometimes. Here, she sort of does that as a rule, saying not all the time, but generally or as a rule. Uh, so that reminded me a little bit of the Toulmin model um, as well. What do you think about that? Is that true? Uh, is her assumption correct that things that are associated with femininity are assigned a lower status in our culture, in American culture, than things associated with men or boys? I think maybe so. I don't know. I was thinking about uh, toys and children, how it always has kind of weirded me out or made me uncomfortable uh, to see little girls playing with dolls. But actually, if I think about it, Playing with a doll and cuddling a doll or making sure a doll is fed or taken care of or taking the doll's temperature um, is incredibly caring and nurturing, right? These are qualities that uh, should be praised. Playing with trucks, that's awesome too, right? But playing with trucks is not better than caring for a doll. And yet uh, in our society, even, even um, to me, I think, well, maybe playing with trucks or playing with blocks might be uh, more valuable or more important than playing with, say, a, a doll. And I have to look at my own assumptions and realize, hey, why is that so? We need more people uh, who are nurturing and kind and who can take care of things. Uh, in the same way that we need more men uh, to go into fields uh, like early childhood education, right? Um, those should be assigned, at least in my opinion, your opinion might differ, uh, more cultural importance. And what she's arguing is that um, when more men do something, uh, it is assigned more culture imp cultural importance. When women do it, uh, a little bit less cultural importance. And we know too the color pink, that's only very recently in Western history that the color pink has become kind of gendered. Uh, but what do you think? Is that true? Uh, I think the example that she gives, it's obviously supposed to be funny, uh, is a good one. Fashion, for instance, is vain and shallow, while baseball is basically a branch of philosophy. Now, I think there's some truth to this. Um, students, I have a lot of students who say that they love doing makeup. They watch makeup tutorials, they've taken classes, and they're incredibly talented. Um, they're not just going to Sephora for fun. They, they really understand the craft of makeup and they're interested and they wanna study it. Uh, why is that considered by some people who I think are not well informed, uh, why is that considered shallow or not very important or frivolous when sports, not that there's anything wrong with sports, right? Uh, to many people are not just fun uh, or silly or entertaining, but are practically a branch of philosophy. Uh, why is that? Or do you think that's not really true or not really true anymore? I think there's a kernel of truth in there. This is my golden line. I always like for you to come up with a golden line that strikes you as really compelling or enraging or provocative or where you agree with part of it, but not the second part. Girls are routinely given pep talks to be anything a boy can be a glorious promotion from their current state. Whereas to encourage a boy to behave more like a girl is to inflict an emasculating demotion. Wow, that line really stunned me. It's sandwiched between kind of funny examples um, of fashion versus uh, baseball, but this was really powerful and really gets to the heart of what she's saying. There is something disturbing about telling a girl that she can be whatever a boy can be. Uh, it suggests that being a boy is somehow better than being a girl or that pursuits that are no known as being feminine are somehow less worthy. Why, why should that be the case, right? Why should we value uh, certain pursuits over others, especially pursuits that encourage um, aggression over pursuits that encourage um, nurturing and team building and listening and thoughtfulness, right? Uh, that's her argument. And I have to say, I kind of agree with it, even though I don't agree with all of her arguments. Uh, do you think it's true that this is a glorious promotion for a girl to say, oh, you can do anything a boy can do. But when we flip it around on its head and we say, hey, to this young boy, you can be anything a girl can be, or you do this like a girl, that that's actually uh, not only a demotion, but a humiliating one. 
She argues later that this is part of the whole problem. To, to call something feminine uh, or girlish um, is to, to men, according to her, to inflict some sort of humiliating wound. I think there are a lot of problems that come from that idea, right? If men feel humiliated by being compared to women, what does that say about how they view women? Now, I have to say, the men in my life, I don't think, um, have this view, but uh, she argues that many men might. What do you think? Maybe it's unfair. Uh, a little bit later on, she talks about the genre of books that begin with women who, uh, and I have to admit, I've read some books or some articles that begin with women who work, women who think too much, women who worry too much. Uh, I thought her argument there was really interesting, but we're starting to um, run low on time or this video is getting pretty long, so I'll skip right along here. So surely many of our most pressing social and political problems, from the Me Too to campus rape, school shootings to President Trump's Twitter posturing, are caused not by lack of assertiveness in women, but by an over-assertiveness among men. Wow, that would be like my second golden line. I found that really powerful. Um, I'm gonna skip down a little bit more. Rather than women being underconfident, men tend to be overconfident in relation to their actual abilities. What do you think about this? First off, do you think the assumption that men are overconfident more often than women are is true? Or is that not really the case in your experience? Do you think that men as a group, and of course we're generalizing here, um, tend to um, act assertive even when they don't know the answer to something or pretend like they know the answer to something even when they don't? Or is that kind of a gross generalization? And same thing, the flip side, um, do you think that women are often apologetic or deferential or overly respectful um, as, as a rule? Do you agree with this or do you disagree with it? But I think these examples are really compelling because here we're not focused on um, the victims, right? The victims of the Me Too movement or the shootings, but we're talking about the perpetrators. Let's not talk about what the victims have done, be under assertive. Let's talk about what the people who have done these things, like uh, committed campus rapes or um, caused mass murders or become mass murderers. Uh, is that caused by an over assertiveness or entitlement in men? What do you think? So here she's, she starts off talking about something kind of silly, right? Uh, workplace culture and gender and using um, sort of a, a commercialized version of feminism um, to, uh, to make sort of excuses for corporations. But now she's getting at something much deeper uh, and much, much more important even than that. I love this syntax here. Take apologizing, the patient zero of the assertiveness movement. Women do too much of it, according to countless op-ed essays, and this is an op-ed essay, books, apps, and shampoo ads. I love that list, right? Uh, we have things ranging from highbrow, like op-eds and books, ending with shampoo ads. And I think, again, that gets to my idea that she's not saying it quite so directly, but she seems to be suggesting that there's some sort of um, commercial appeal or some sort of um, profit from this idea, uh, this assertiveness movement that she is troubled by in some way. And I think the shampoo ad conveys that. Think about Dove ads. Uh, the, the, the Dove ads that I see are mostly for body positivity, which I think is awesome. Uh, but there are a lot of ads for women's products that seem to somehow capitalize on this assertiveness movement without doing the real work uh, that can be a little bit disturbing to some people. Uh, there's even a Gmail plugin that's supposed to help us quit the, the uh, practice of apologizing too much uh, by underlining things in angry red wiggle. So here she's using personification, and I think it's pretty funny and pretty relatable. Uh, let's move on to a few more lines here. Okay, so here she gets to kind of her thesis and also her solution. And it's worth pointing out, she doesn't give a whole lot of specific solutions here. After all, it's a pretty short article, but she does um, kind of open up the door for some possibilities. So perhaps instead of nagging women, and I think she's using that term on purpose, nagging women, right? Nagging women, not that the women themselves are nagging, but they're, they are being nagged. So she's kind of playing with that stereotype. Perhaps instead of nagging women to scramble to meet the male standard, we should instead be training men and boys to aspire to women's cultural norms and selling those norms to men as both default and desirable, to be more deferential, to reflect and listen and apologize where an apology is due, and if unsure, 
to err on the side of superfluous sorry than an absent one, to aim for modesty and humility and cooperation rather than blow hard arrogance. So she's saying instead of selling these ideas about assertiveness and being more like a man to women, uh, instead, we should flip that on its head and encourage men to um, to cultivate some of these traits that we see um, as less valuable, but actually they're more valuable. It would be a challenge for sure. Pity the human resources manager trying to sell a deference training course to male employees. She would need to paint all the PowerPoint slides black and hand out Nerf guns just to get started. So a lot of people in the discussion commented on how this is over the top, this is hyperbole. Of course, you don't have to get men to listen to something by uh, showing pictures of Nerf guns, right? Uh, and I think she's aware of that. I think she's being tongue in cheek here. She's trying to be kind of funny. Um, but then another really compelling line that comes right after a goofy one. As long as the threat of emasculation is a baseline terror for men, Encouraging them to act more like women still instinctively feels like a form of humiliation. Is that true? That when men are encouraged to be like women or when they're viewed as women, to them that, that is the ultimate humiliation. Um, to any man that I'm friends with or um, that I respect, no, it should not. It would not be a baseline form of humiliation. In fact, it could even be a compliment, depending upon the situation. Um, but do you think that as a whole, that's true, that being compared to a woman um, somehow feels degrading to a man? And if so, then why are women being told to be more like men? Then we have some of the so what. Promoting quality such as deference, humility, cooperation, and listening skills will benefit not only women, but also businesses, politics, and even men themselves, freeing them from the constant and exhausting expectation to perform a grandstanding masculinity, even when they feel insecure or unsure. So here, even though I would certainly not say that this is a Rogerian essay at all, uh, here she does think about the win-win. How can this uh, benefit everyone? How can reframing this conversation about gender, especially gender in the workplace, how can this benefit everyone? Well, it can help businesses bottom line. It can help uh, politi politics become more um, inclusive and more fair, maybe generate some fresh ideas. But also she says it will free men themselves from something that I, I can't really relate to this, but might be kind of exhausting if it's true. And I don't know that it is. That's up for you to decide. If it's true that men have to perform this masculinity, uh, pretending to know answers when really they don't, um, being kind of a, a grandstander uh, or being aggressive all the time, uh, if that's true, then this is permission to say, hey, you don't have to do that anymore right? Uh, you can just be yourself. Now, maybe that version of yourself is someone who's just kind of aggressive, right? Uh, or maybe your version of yourself is much more sensitive and complex and sometimes aggressive, but sometimes um, much more deferential. You can really be who you are uh, and not have to perform these gender roles all the time. So she says, what's in it for men and for businesses? And then I'll end just with, with this. Um, the last line, she says, perhaps some capitulation poses in the bathroom before the big meeting might help. Clearly here she's being sarcastic and she's echoing back or hearkening back to what she said at the beginning, right? Um, these tips or strategies to be a lady boss. And of course that term lady boss is so insulting already, even though it can be some people a sign of empowerment. And I understand that. Uh, what she is arguing is that lady boss, or I think what she's hinting at is that lady boss um, is kind of redundant because a boss can be a lady. It's almost like saying lady doctor or lady scientist, right? How about just scientist? But for many people, the term like lady boss can be empowered. It could be kind of a rallying cry, uh, but she referenced in the beginning, like doing power poses in front of the meeting, in front of the mirror before a big meeting. Here she's saying, oh, okay, we can solve this problem then. You can do some uh, capitulation poses, like kneel down or go like this or say sorry in front of the mirror to practice before a big meeting. So she's being sarcastic. Um, she's being over the top, but I think it ends with kind of a hilarious image uh, that plays on some of these stereotypes.